morning, good morning, good morning, and thank you for joining me on another episode of the Roundtable Talk Show. I am your host, Sharifa Hardy, and do I have an amazing show for you today. But before we get into today's show, I'm so excited. I am so excited. Today marks the one-year anniversary of the Roundtable Talk Show. It's been a year since I launched this show, and oh, it has been amazing. I have met so many new people, made new friends. Have worked on different panels, had different leads. We have gone so far in a year that it has been incredible. And not only have we gone this far in a year, we have gone this far during a global pandemic. So one of the things that I have been able to see on a firsthand basis is how we can all come together to help each other. So before I go ahead and introduce today's guest, I'm going to ask you to do what I always ask you to do. That is to go out and be an evangelist for the Roundtable Talk Show. There's someone in your network, in your neighborhood, I don't know, maybe it's your co-worker sitting across the cubicle for you. Maybe they want to start their business and they don't know how to leave their day job or how to work their day job until they're ready to build their business. But they won't have this information. You're someone in your house, maybe it's your spouse, your child, your neighborhood. They will not have this information unless you go ahead and share this show. So go ahead and make that post, send that tweet. But friends don't let friends miss out on the Roundtable Talk Show. So while you're going ahead and introducing the show to your friends, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our first guest, the amazing Miss Courtney Barbie. Courtney has been in accounting for 20 years and over the past eight years has grown an accounting and outsourced CFO company to over 200 business clients and 10 employees. Good morning, Courtney. How are you? Great. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. Where are you? The background just looks amazing. So I'm out in my garden. It's a nice day here in Raleigh and uh, between children and pets it seemed like the quietest place was outside the house. <laughs> I can imagine because we didn't want the children or the pets wandering into the show. Mm -hmm. So I'm <laughs> hiding. I, I'm, as a mother, I know that feeling well. There's certain little hiding spots you can go in and get away from kids. So tell us, Courtney, who are you? What do you do? And what are you passionate about? So I have been an accountant, I think, since birth. I was seven years old and had a line graph of my allowance savings because I wanted to buy a skateboard. And I'm also a storyteller. I grew up to be someone who wanted to tell stories, but I do it with numbers. So we get the numbers accurate so that we've got all of our facts straight. But then we do three types of accounting. We do the accounting you do for your taxes, which tells one story that's, you know, making the business look as bad as possible. We tell the story for the bank, which is making the business look great. But my favorite part is the story we tell for operational accounting, which is where we really use the numbers and the facts to tell the business owners the truth about what their business is doing well, what needs work, and how to just set a plan going forward. So like you mentioned on the introduction, I've actually been working in accounting and getting paid for it for about 20 years. We started this company eight years ago. It has just been a period of incredible growth. And especially during the pandemic, we found that we actually grew even faster. We've always tried to be very cutting edge, very ahead of the curve with technology and things like that. And when all these businesses suddenly had to rework their systems for online sales or adjusting away from the office, we were just very uniquely positioned to help them. So it's been an interesting uh, time for sure for us you know as far as me personally besides owning the bookkeeper I am of course a mom I'm an outdoors person I don't know if any of our other uh, guests today love backpacking or hiking but that is something I can make friends about and talk on all day besides accounting well Courtney you know I hate to break it to you but we're not going to be really good friends because <laughs> I only go camping in hotels so, I mean, but we could talk about some other things. I'm sure we'll find other things in common. You know, if I go outside, it might be bugs, it might be dirt, it might be a whole, but no, I'll take a hotel and a mate. 
Thank you very much. You gave us a lot of information, Courtney. It was very interesting. And one of the things that I always laugh at, I'm a talk show host who actually went to college to be an accountant. But I was like, this, I can't do, sit in a cubicle and look at numbers all day. I love to talk to people instead. Now, I want to go. What I want to go back to is this line chart. Who created this graph for you as a child? I did it on graph paper. Okay, well, where did you get the idea from? I, I guess we must have touched on it in second grade math or or something. Or I probably watched my dad, who you know helped who founded this company and who until recently was the majority owner i probably watched him putting graphs together because he was a cfo and i just knew what how much money i needed to save to buy a skateboard and i knew i wanted to get there so how did you go raise your skateboard money of course a lot of scrub in the bathroom yeah Oh, your chores. Okay. Were you one of those people? Because I always find with entrepreneurs and serial entrepreneurs, especially ones like I've been doing this forever. They either had, they sold candy, they mowed lawns, they had the lemonade stand. So were you, did you do any of those things aside from just chores? This is going to sound like I was such a little delinquent. Um, I sold loose candy cigarettes. You know how you used to be able to buy the boxes of candy cigarettes? <laughs> I went to school and sold individual ones for more than they would you know have cost in the pack <laughs> and i made some money that way besides the chores it, for some reason i feel like this is one of the very few times that you actually admit this as an adult that these are the things that you were doing as a child yeah it's not as cute as the line graph story <laughs> Courtney, you're a lot of fun. I'm going to come back to you. I want to go ahead and introduce our next guest, the incredible Miss Jennifer Letwith. Jennifer Letwith is owner of Scholar Ready, an educational services company. Scholar Ready teaches math, writing, and reading, conducts personal essay writing workshops, and prepares students for PSAT, SAT, and ACT exams. 16 years ago, she started Scholar Ready to help students to graduate with as little student loan debt as possible. The keys to college scholarships are perseverance, strong writing skills, and competitive test scores. Good morning, Jennifer. How are you? Um, well, good morning, Sharifa. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me today. How are you doing? I am fine. Thank you for helping the babies. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for that introduction. Yes, my job is as serious as a heart attack. I, I like to liken it as a, a think of it, think of me as a doctor. When a patient goes to the doctor and the doctor says, you know what, your blood pressure is higher than normal. Um, so because of that, we're gonna put you on some meds. And I have experience with this with, uh, with, with, uh, with family members who have high blood pressure. We're gonna put you on some meds and we're gonna continue to monitor your blood pressure. And then the patient goes, hopefully, the patient goes and fills the prescription and takes the meds to, uh, to manage the high blood pressure. Um, the doctor doesn't wait until the patient has a stroke or a heart attack or um, has to begin dialysis to uh, diagnose and to prescribe something to control the high blood pressure. And that's very similar to an issue that I face in my practice. The main problem, and I get to do all these wonderful things, I get to work with students to help them prepare for these exams, but these exams are just a tool, are just tools to help me to prepare students for, uh, to help them to improve their reading skills. The main issue is that students cannot read. And I work in a practice where people pay me <laughs> to do this job. So- well, I, I, would, I didn't, I I don't mean to cut you off, but that's no, no, come on. what I tend to do. But no, I wanted to know why that was funny, because you started to laugh. You said, people pay me to do this. And no. it seemed like so, so, you know, because, because, because when I talk about literacy, or often when we talk about literacy and reading, people always think about poor kids. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm saying, well, it's not just poor kids. I work with students who, I'm, I'm in uh, the Houston area, and I've worked with students who live in homes that are valued at higher than the median value of a home in Houston. I can't compare you in California, that's a 
totally different story. Uh, but they live in they live in homes that are higher than the median value of a home in Houston. And these students. So let me translate reading. what Jennifer just said. What Jennifer mm -hmm. just said: these students, their families have some money. That's what yes. she said. Okay. Correct. Go ahead. Correct. Go ahead. Correct. Go ahead. Correct. I got you, Thank Jennifer. Thank you. On the same Thank day. You. I'm translating. I'm Thank your you. translator today. Thank you. And the main and and when I talk with parents about um, you know when I when I have I have a colleague I refer uh, she works with the little ones I work with students who are in junior high and high school she works with the younger ones in elementary school and she you know she tries and you know we try to tell parents all the time when they're little hey you know little Johnny needs help with reading and they just don't do anything about it they they don't you know and then when uh little johnny gets to middle school and as little johnny goes to uh goes through high school i talk with the parents and i say hey you know little johnny needs help with reading we need to work on this and they just look at me and i'm like you realize i'm the doctor telling you that you have high blood pressure like this is not reading is not a thing like oh you know little johnny never liked you know playing basketball a little johnny never liked um you know watercolors that's not what this is this is the lifeblood of your child's future um your child's education your child's ability to compete in an ever-changing economy um so at scholar ready we help students yes we for the name of the business is scholar ready because we are have we will prepare the students to be ready for whatever academic challenges he or she faces. In today's environment, will the PSAT and SAT and ACT exams find their ways uh, to extinction? I don't know that. But what I know in the state of California, state of Cal uh, schools in the state of California are doing away with the SAT um, and ACT exams as a means That was going to be one of my questions. That mm -hmm. was actually going to be one of the questions mm -hmm. that, that I asked when we discussed. But Jennifer, I'm going to come back to you. Mm -hmm. I want to go ahead and introduce our next guest, mm -hmm. Mr. Craig Dempsey. Mm -hmm. Craig is the co-founder and CEO of Biz Latin Hub Group, an organization dedicated to assisting investors in Latin America and the Caribbean. Craig holds a degree in mechanical engineering, a master's degree in project management, and other certifications covering logistics, personal management, and government administration. Good morning, Craig. How are you? I am excellent. And look, first up, congratulations on the one-year anniversary. I'm sure you're quite pleased. Thank you. I am. I, I'm not only pleased, but I've breathed a sigh of relief because one year ago today, I said, I don't even know if this gonna work. You're gonna throw five strangers in a conversation from different industries. How is this gonna work? Now I know. And before I get on to introduce myself, let me ask you one thing. What is the one thing that you've learned over that, that year? And it, it, I like you, Craig, go in there and be the co-host today. But <laughs> one thing that I've learned, and I actually learned it in one particular show, for the first two or three months, I was so nervous because again, I don't know if y'all know people, but people aren't always nice and friendly and they always surprise you. And so I, I was nervous about how this was going to work out. And then I had one show I was particularly nervous about. It was a show where this lady who it has mental illness, she has schizophrenia and she shares her story and she wants to help other people who are suffering. I had another lady who was just so, I felt like she was so corporate, you know, she wasn't giving me any emotion, any feelings or anything. I asked her a question. She's like, yes. No. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God, what's going to happen on this show? And so we start the show and the, the lady suffering from mental illness started talking. And before I could even ask a question or inter interject or anything, the corporate lady was like, my cousin suffers from mental illness and I understand and it's hard for the family. I was like, oh, this is gonna be all right. This is gonna be all right. So I just learned that no matter how different we are, like you're on the other side of the world, Craig, and I'm here in Long Beach, California, but especially in this one year, this particular year, Everyone in the world has learned how to get along and how to work together and how to come together. So I've just learned that we have more in common than we do that's different. It's a very warm and nice message. 
And I will be sure to try to show emotion as well. Uh, <laughs> except, just to make sure it's a good show there. Um, Thank you. And look, me out. Well, exactly. That's what I'm here for. And look, I guess for, for a quick introduction, um, I'm actually Australian by nationality, but um, I actually live um, in Bogota, Colombia. Mm. Uh, and for those not familiar with that, that's actually in South America. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so that's where I am. Um, long story, I guess, and the obvious thing is, how did I get here? Uh, I was a military officer in Australia for many, many years. After leaving the military and the various wonderful trips I had to the Middle East, etc., uh, I decided to work in mining. I worked in mining in Australia. I had the fortune of going up to Canada, worked in mining, got bored with that. It rained too much. And did you know it's very cold in Canada? Not my thing. So I decided to go down to Peru, also in South America. Did that for a while, working in mining. Decided I had enough of that. Went traveling, found myself in, in the country of Colombia, which is just north of Peru. Ended up heading up an engineering company for Latin America for a while. And then pretty much came to the realization that um, I just want to do my own business. Uh, you know, I'm working for corporations and everything else. So I went off and set up a business. Uh, and I guess a few short years later, uh, my principal business now is an integrated accounting law recruitment firm. Uh, and I've got offices in 18 countries. Um, so we're, I guess, a mid-sized uh, company focused on Latin America. Uh, it's a bit odd that I'm an engineer and I own one of the biggest accounting law recruitment firms in the region, but that's just how life takes you that way. It's a bit unpredictable. Um, so, yeah, that's sort of how I ended up in this part of the world. Um, you know, what do we do? Look, we principally support mid to large international companies, you know, a lot of Fortune 500 companies, to basically do international expansion to Latin America. So we support them to understand the market, how to do business, how to understand the culture and all the different laws and regulations and all that wonderful stuff that, that goes into that to, to support their business operations, um, which is fantastic. Although to be fair, what I actually get more passionate about is more helping, I guess, smaller entrepreneurs that actually want to enter and do business. Uh, why? Because it's far more personal. At the end of the day, if you're dealing with a Fortune 500 company, it's about pushing papers around, getting signatures, having uh, calls with lots of different executives, et cetera. You know, it, it's it's not quite the same as somebody's their idea. They want to bring it to fruition. Uh, you know, they want to enter that market, particularly if they've got some sort of passionate reason why they want to go to Latin America. You know, a lot of our clients come from, you know, US, Canada, Europe, et cetera. Uh, you know, and all that is, you know, there's the business side of it, but there's also the other side of, you know, trying to, to get them to understand there are cultural differences between uh, those parts of the world and Latin America. And obviously it's a bit strange that an Australian is explaining perhaps someone from the US or Long Beach, California about Latin America. Uh, but that's the sort of, that's the sort of the gap we have. Um, and it's great. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, you know, even during this pandemic times, we're still expanding. Uh, we're opening probably a new office every three or four months. Uh, yeah, so things are pretty good at the moment. Uh, you know, I'm hoping uh, we'll be able to continue to support those clients entering the region. Wow, I, I love it. Now, Craig, you're a successful businessman. You have a lot of entrepreneurs. Maybe it's their first day being an entrepreneur. What have you learned in your process that you would have done different, done better, done over? What, what are some of the things you learned along the way? Sure. Look, at the end of the day, someone making the decision that they want to be an entrepreneur, to be fair, that is half of the battle. At the end of the day, we have so many people that have great ideas and they go to their lunchroom at the office or their family home and they say, what about this? What about that? But actually taking that next step of actually doing something or at least talking about it, you know, firstly, you know, that, that itself is, is a good thing. And I encourage people to, you know, you need to give it a go. At the end of the day, sometime in your life, even if it's a side hustle, it's a hobby, you've got to try something for yourself, okay? With that said, you also need to be pragmatic. The reality is almost nobody is successful or at least completely successful with their first business, okay? And then that doesn't mean you then have a second, third, fourth business. That may mean you actually have to pivot or change what you do. You have to adjust, okay, because we don't have all the answers. Uh, and I guess the, the last thing is know your numbers. At the end of the day, this is why Courtney and accountants and things are really important. 
if you don't understand your numbers, then even if you are successful, you still may, may not make any money. I actually have a, a good friend um, that has a, a business here in Colombia. And unfortunately, after putting years and years of work in and he's quite successful in his own right, the reality is his business was never going to make any money because there's no margin and it's not a large enough market. Um, so it's really quite important. But, you know, the thing I, I tell everybody is, look, you know, I have complete respect for somebody who's willing to give it a go, regardless of whether it's successful or a failure, because you learn a lot. And I can tell you right now, you know, through the evolutions and, you know, we, we are quite successful these days, you know, we have to change a lot. And there were failures, a lot of failings along the way, without a doubt. I like that. Craig says, give it a go. That's going to be my new phrase for now. Just give it a go, okay? Exactly. You've given it a go and now you've lasted a year. Who knows? In 10 years' time, you'll be saying, well, there you go. Yes, I love it. Craig, I'm going to come back to you. I want to go ahead and introduce our next guest, Miss Michelle Roshenzimmer. Michelle is a consultant and producer helping creatives and leaders bring their ideas to life and develop their businesses. She works with a range of creatives and leaders to bridge the gap between the creative and business, coordination and management side of the equation. Good morning, Michelle, how are you? Good morning, I'm doing okay, how are you doing? I'm excellent, thank you for joining us. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you for having me, I'm so glad to be here and congratulations on doing this for, for a year. Yes, it wasn't easy, but <laughs> The grace of God, we are here. Where are you located, Michelle? <clears throat> I'm, I'm actually based in Los Angeles. Um, oh, okay. One of, yeah, one of the um, few that can say that I'm a native to, to the the LA area. Um, daughter of immigrants, but you know, born and raised here. Okay, we'll have to drive down the street one day, and we'll have tea or lunch or I would, I would love that. You know, after actually, everything opens up. I, I was actually in Long Beach for a couple of years for grad school, so. Um, oh wow! Yeah, so it's just you know, it's I it's I spend a lot of my time in Southern California. I love it. Like it's great to get out, but it's home. Yeah, I know the feeling. I definitely know the feeling. Now, Michelle, tell us, tell us, tell us, who are you? What do you do? What are you passionate about? Um, so I have been. <clears throat> sorry, my. Um, so I've been a sucker for stories since I was a little kid. Um, my parents. Okay, I'm sorry. Me. Stop. I didn't mean to cut you off, but that's yeah. who I am. You have been a what? Sucker for stories since I like. Okay, I've okay, stories. I missed all of that. I wanted to hear yeah. it. Sorry, um, I've loved stories since I was a little kid. Um, my parents took me to see a production of Beauty and the Beast when I was a kid, and between that and a backstage tour, I was beyond hooked. It was always, you know, reading and stuff growing up, but. The germ of what I'm what I'm doing now actually started when I was um, when I was in college. Um, I was an art school student who very much scoffed at the business and management side of things, despite kind of that being a lot of my strength. I'm like, oh, it's okay. We'll figure it out. It's totally fine. Um, but you know, knowing knowing when I was an undergrad that I wanted to you know kind of keep going back to school, I took some time off between undergrad and grad school and went to um, Cal State Long Beach or one of a few programs that offer a dual um, business and arts degree. And I'm like, perfect. I get the business side, I get the art side. This is very much of like at my wheelhouse from some of the work I already started doing. And, you know, and I was, I was a student for full time on top of um, started, I was picking up some consulting gigs. Um, and with that, I ended up shifting my, shifting my focus in, when I was in grad school more towards the business side of the equation. But something I kind of continually started noticing was with the creatives and artists and like, you know, leaders, managers that they, they love what they do. They have, they're really great at the idea side of it. But then when it comes to actually executing it, that's often when they need help. You know, it's just as much of like the, hey, how can we actually make this a reality to you also, you are also, whether it's a for-profit or non-profit, you are still running a business and you, like, you need to be able to know how this all works, have, like, how are you, basically, how are you guys going to make money to sustain yourself and grow and do all the, all the stuff you want to do, pay all the people. And, you know, so with, with that, I... Um, I ended up starting my own company, MVR Creative, about a year and a half ago. And, you know, it's 
It's been fun. It's been a little challenging. Um, you know, with that, I started doing some more on the producing side I, of things. Um, and with everything with COVID over the last year has put a lot of those projects on hold, but thankfully things are slowly starting to pick up again. And I'm, I'm excited, you know, see where, despite having a little bit of a rock, rocky start personally, I'm very much looking forward to seeing what 2021 has in store. Wow, that is amazing. That is incredible. I love what you had to say. One of the things that stood out to me is when you mentioned the um, companies and the nonprofits. I have found that it is more difficult for the nonprofits to have that mindset of we actually need money, that we need money to operate. I mean, so often they are so busy trying to save the world that they don't understand or take into the account the business side of being a nonprofit, would you find, what have you found, Michelle? You know, that you can, that, you know, that for-profit and non-for-profits, some of like the reporting is a little different, you know, nonprofits tend to be a lot more mission-driven and will put the money back in the company, but you're, you, it's still, you're still running a business. Like you're still, you still need to cover your expenses, the people like, yeah, you can have volunteers, but you still, you still need to, have like the basic things that you need to cover as a business is just structured a little differently. And, you know, whether, whether it's through grants or like people paying for services or like varying other options, like there, there are, there are ways to make the, to make the model work that also align with your mission, vision, and values. Absolutely. I love it. I want to go over to Courtney for a moment. Courtney, what were your thoughts on what Craig had to say about the numbers? You know, it's it's so interesting uh, that he's working in Latin America. I actually minored in Spanish and did a lot of focus on business Spanish and not just the language, but the cultural differences. And I say that because numbers are universal. I mean, having the numbers right is essential and we do see it all the time where someone either can't pivot their business to be successful in a changing market or the business despite all the passion and talent in the world just was never going to scale appropriately to make money but i think almost every business that's run by a flexible enough owner can't can have that success it's just you know how much they're willing to bend before they break if that makes sense um and i do think that what he's doing and working with people in an entirely different culture especially as an australian and an outsider is wonderful because i think in some ways it's hard to teach things you've never learned someone who is native to that culture doesn't know what it's like to try to learn it because they've grown up immersed in it and so everything he's doing down there is just fascinating to me Greg, you fascinated Courtney. Look, I, I'm glad. I wish I had that impression on all women, but what can I say? Greg's <laughs> um, a charmer. Uh, I see that now. <laughs> uh, uh, look, aren't you lovely and sweet? Um, look, you know, one of the, the biggest complications we have down here is trying to bridge you know, a cultural understanding. You know, it, it is somewhat difficult. Uh, and here's a simple example. Generally speaking, in, uh, particularly in the US and other cultures, if I send you an email, you will generally receive that email and you'll respond to me, or you might say, thanks, Craig, I've got your email and I'll get back to you. There's some sort of positive confirmation that you're now doing something. It's very common in Latin America, and firstly, I'm doing something that I shouldn't. I'm generalizing all Latinos the same, and they're very different between the countries. But in general, when they receive an email, it's not instinctive for them to actually respond and say, I've got that, I'm working on it. They actually go away, gather all the information and then respond back. So what happens is often a delay there. So usually we find our North American client gets annoyed because they think nobody's doing anything. Conversely, the person uh, in Latin America is doing what is culturally normal, which is don't respond until you have all the information. Um, so it's just little things like that, trying to, to bridge the gap at the same time as obviously trying to support clients to actually do business. Um, so that's one of the wonderful things we have, but look, the reality is, you know, it's never boring uh, and always presents some opportunities. Uh, and fortunately, we do get to interact with, with the, the Courtney's of the world, particularly in the US, 
Um, and we, they're generally, you know, a lot of our, you know, the CFOs, et cetera, are our points of contact in the US we work with. So we do spend a lot of time explaining the differences and also what to expect. Um, you know, unfortunately, you know, things down in uh, this part of the world are a lot more bureaucratic. You know, one of the things you wouldn't realise here in some of the countries here is it's very, very common. You sign documents and you actually have to get an ink fingerprint and fingerprint those documents. That's very, very common. So a lot of people walking around the streets here with ink all over their hands all day. Um, just silly things like this that you just wouldn't think happen, but it's just just the how things operate. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's, it's amusing, but conversely, enormous opportunities. Um, so that's why we do it. Well, one of the things that I like, because I look at that example of even the email a little bit different. I look at it like it's more of a relaxed culture where they're not so uptight, where they have to be like, I got to get that email. I got to get it. I've always said that in America, we are all about the almighty dialer. Everything is about business. They take siestas. They, they're more family oriented. So while we're rushing to respond to that email to make sure everybody knows we're working and we're busy, they prioritize family and prioritize that break and focus. So I, that's one of the things that I noticed. Maybe I'm off, Greg. No, look, there, there is a different priority. Uh, and to be fair, it varies a lot between whether you're talking Mexico, Colombia, Argentina, Brazil, etc. You know, at the end of the day, it's like generalizing Asia. Uh, right. You know, it, it, or, uh, I guess generalizing or you know, all countries that speak English are the same. Well, there are some differences here. But yes, you're right. They, they do have a slightly different prioritization uh, in life, uh, particularly because a lot of it relates back to, you know, the Spanish, the Portuguese, and sort of Mediterranean heritage there. Um, so so that, that is important. Um, and I guess that does overlay. For example, it's very, very common here still that Sunday is a family day, uh, regardless. It's not necessarily some go to church, some don't. But it's more of a family day and they get together and have their family lunches and things, which, you know, particularly where I'm from Australia, even when I live in Canada, et cetera, it's not so common. It happens, but, you know, it's just a little bit different how people operate. Um, you know, so people are a little bit different, but also, you know, things take a bit more time. So people are a bit more patient down here where, you know, obviously in the U.S., everyone wants it and they want it now. It's a consumerism sort of behavior, um, which, you know, the reality is, how the US operates allows that to happen. You go online, you order something on Amazon, it's there the next day. Um, you know, you order something out here, it could take two weeks to get here. Um, <laughs> I guess I'll be staying in Southern California then. I, I, it may not be the next day here in Southern California. It may be the same day. I am spoiled. I know Michelle, we love LA, right? Yeah, it's home. <laughs> Like, like I love travel, I and I've I've always kind of like been fortunate to be able to do that. But it's home. It's a different, and it's so different, like culture culturally too. Of like, you know, I'm Middle Eastern, and it's just kind of seeing that aspects of that culture and like like more tra like traditional like American cultures. There there are some differences. So it's, you know, it's always it can be interesting to kind of navigate those different um, cultures where wherever you are. Yes, and just appreciate everyone and appreciate the differences, appreciate the similarities, because over the last year, we've all gone through the same experience, no matter where we are in the world. And one of the things that has happened is a lot more families are sitting down for that Sunday dinner or that dinner at night than ever before in history. Now, I want to go back to the question I wanted to ask Jennifer initially but this COVID pandemic has affected the student. They've affected the babies, Jennifer. Yes, it has. So are you asking how has COVID affected them? No, I haven't got to the question yet. I'm just saying oh, okay. it affected the baby. Oh, no, it yeah, it but in California, there's no, uh, I, you know, I, I read, and it's my understanding that the reason they stopped a lot of the testing is because of the pandemic. It would, it would be unfair to the students to grade them on that merit, and it would be unfair to the colleges and universities because those scores would, you know, affect them, even though it's at the end of the day, nobody's fault. Mm -hmm. So, so, so what are you asking? Uh, I'm asking, how have you seen the SAT, PSAT, okay. the testing process being affected as a result of the global pandemic? I mean, you've seen the, the tests being outright canceled, 
Um, you have, I, I know in 2020, I saw a decline in people calling me to prepare for exams. There was in my private uh, practice and in my group practice, there was a decline. Um, the interesting thing is that I'm starting to see um, a lot of th times and um, you all, uh, Courtney and Craig and Michelle, you all know this, you work with business owners. Um, a lot of times perception is reality. And I think because the governor of Texas, because I'm in, in the Houston area, the governor of Texas uh, rescinded the mask mandate. So he's basically opened everything up. Um, um, while the reality is COVID is still a real thing. Um, the perception that people have is that, oh, we're getting back to normal. So I'm starting to hear from more, more parents saying, okay, let's prepare. And the schools are saying, yes, we're test optional, but I have parents who are who have gone to the campus tours and learned all about test optional and they're calling me and they're like, OK, we need to prepare for this exam. So it's just kind of like, I don't know, it's I almost feel like, you know, I'm that restaurant owner during COVID where you have some people who want to die, who want to come to the restaurant and eat inside and they're all for it. And then you have some people who are like, no, nah, we're just going to do takeout and we're just going to wait. So I'll say that. It's hard to tell. Some people are still preparing. Some people aren't. Um, what's going to happen is, I mean, one thing I was listening to Craig and he was talking about how you have to be aware that all of these countries in um, Latin America, um, they don't do business the same. You know, there, there are distinctions, just like there are distinctions among um, countries that just speak English or that, or that are English speaking countries. Um, and that's for, for a worker to understand that, that worker has to have critical thinking skills. And with these exams, um, yes, the exams, sometimes in the preparation and the, 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 the exaltedness of, oh, when a kid gets a perfect score, I think that's kind of absurd it, because it doesn't, I mean, you know, a kid who gets a perfect score and a kid who gets slightly less than a perfect score, there's not going to be much difference between those students in terms of college preparation. But when you look at students, the thing about SAT, PSAT, ACT is that those exams kind of tell the truth. And when you see a student who scores below a certain level on these exams, the truth is, is that this student is not prepared to read and to do math and to think critically in college, even in the workplace, even if the student foregoes college and goes straight to work. So whatever what's going to happen, we're going to see. Time is going to tell. What we're probably going to see in the workforce is you're probably going to have more employers um, complaining about the students lack of reading skills, you're going to see colleges, they're going to have to build, these colleges are going to have to build whole remedial courses and wings of remedial courses and battalions of remedial courses, because these students just, the test scores often tell, reveal who can read and who cannot. So I would say that we need to wait a few years as these students go through college and see what are the graduation rates like. That's going to really tell us um, you know, how COVID really affected us and how the policies that people are making today about these exams are going to affect us down the road. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I had a question for Jennifer, if you don't mind. Oh, sure. I don't mind at all. In all seriousness, have you ever considered some sort of courses for adults? Because I, I know what we've seen in our business is that our employees' communication skills, we closed our office and everyone to work from home. They need much stronger communication skills than I'm seeing a lot of the people we're interviewing come into the workforce, even as, you know, adults in their 40s. And it's been a real decline over the last few years, it seems like, in people's ability to think critically and to communicate complex ideas. Have you considered offering that? I've thought about that. My my challenge is how do I get people to take it seriously enough to pay for it? Because I tell parents and I have to I tell them nicely, but I but I'm very blunt about it. And I say, you know, your child needs to work on his or her reading skills. Oh no, we're not gonna worry about it. We're too busy for that. We're gonna focus on, we're gonna pour all our time and effort into AAU basketball and you know, all our money and our time is gonna go there. We're not gonna focus on literacy. So I, you know, in the adult world, I think an employer has to say, you have to do this or you're going to get fired. 
just like in the in the in the in the um, child world, the state of Texas has to say your child has to pass this test or he will not graduate from high school. That's when people take it seriously. They won't, even though they know in their heart of hearts that their children are struggling, even though those employees know that they struggle with community, well, I don't know, sometimes adults may not even know. Um, you know, sometimes they just don't. Um, but, you know, it has to be some kind of trigger that really makes people understand this is a real problem and I can improve this. I can get better at this. And there are tools and resources to help me do that. Yes, I, I understand that completely. But I, I, I completely agree with you as far as the reading, the literacy, that aspect. But I am also concerned over the past year about the students and their ability to to cope um, mentally. You know, so many students, so many children are going through this experience and it's throwing them off um and it's interesting because even before this global pandemic about i would say it was a good five six years ago the state of california really started pushing this k through 12 idea the idea of homeschooling it really became a bit i don't know where everyone else is is if they really started to hear about it but it was here in california and you know, everybody has their own views. I personally, aside from this pandemic where we didn't have a choice, am not a huge fan of homeschooling. You know, and I had a friend, she was so for it. She, she was like, yeah, this is what we're going to do. It's going to allow my son to get an education that he needs and, 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 you know, and all this other stuff. And I said, but what about the social aspect? Because what you do then is you take a child or a student who is used to learning in a certain way in a certain environment, and then you put them in the employment world with everyone else and this person may not know how to respond and what happened and, and I'm, you know I didn't like that it happened but what turned up happening is her son became the valedictorian for his class wow. but he went to give the valedictorian speech looked out across the audience because again he's not used to people right burst out in tears and ran off the stage and I was like um that's what I was trying to tell you, the whole emotional aspect, you know, I didn't want to be right, but it's more than just, people go to, kids go to school for more than just the education. You learn more than just what you learn in the books. You learn how to deal with people. You learn how to communicate. You learn these things by being around other students. So my kids are homeschooled. Talk to me, Courtney. <laughs> um, and I'm not pro homeschooling in all situations. Let me say that right now. Uh, but my kids, the pandemic and the virtual school was too stressful. For them, so we went to a pure homeschool model. And we we're very fortunate that in our neighborhood, there are literally about 30 kids all within 10 years or so of each other. And between that, they've got nine cousins and church and everything else, they honestly probably get more socialization and just outside playtime in a day than they would if they were sitting in a classroom right now. And in this area, Raleigh's a very large homeschool community. We do the co-ops, we do the field trips, we do all these things because I don't homeschool them to shelter them from the world. I homeschool them just for the education purposes. But I have seen exactly what you're talking about. And I think it's important to kind of have this distinction that there are very much kind of splinter groups within the homeschool community. And there are those people who homeschool kind of just to keep their kids away from everything. Personally, I homeschool so I can expose them to more. They've actually, my oldest has come with me to networking events. He can talk to adults. We go to museums. We go to protest marches. We're, we're out in the world every day, but I have absolutely seen what you're talking about as well, where, you know, the only world they see is their family and their home. And I think that can be very damaging to kids. Well, thank you for doing homeschooling right. You know, I just want parents to take into account the social aspect. These children have to go out into the world. So I want to go back to the, the protest. I mean, we don't have to get too much uh, into it, into details, but what made you decide to do that with your child? Uh, you know, it was one of those things where we've always been very 
open in an age appropriate way about what's going on in the world and our our privileges and our advantages there are things that i want my kids to understand and recognize as they grow up you know uh and of course i've lived in the triangle my whole life was born in durham you know we have a lot of racial tension in our community and it was the sort of thing where i thought you know so long as we can go early while things are safe before you know sometimes after dark there's conflict and issues you know i want them to understand what other people face and have that exposure to you know this is their community these are their neighbors you know that are hurting and suffering and i want them to recognize that and understand it early on because i think it can be very uh easy to say well my kids aren't bad kids or my kids aren't racist without actually teaching them to be anti-racist or teaching them to use the privilege they have to do the right thing mm -hmm. i think that's very powerful now michelle with everything going on in the world there were protests there were the global pandemic to me the, when when there's a lot of change in the world that's when producers can use that creative side that you discussed earlier what are some of the ways that you used your creative side over the last year? Um, so one of the things that I um, I started doing back, this was back in April of last year, um, where I, you know, I, I have a lot of friends that are writers, performers, kind of in like across the spectrum by way of like what they do creatively. They were still creating work, but because we call, all call it really gather, I, you know, set up in part set through like a group, but like started organizing virtual table reads and, you know, which is great because like it's very much focused on new work. Um, and it's very much to give the, like the right, like, an, like writers the chance to, you know, have, have like a new piece that they're doing no matter where it is read aloud. We've done everything from musicals, TV scripts, films, plays, like you name it, we've kind of done it at this point. Um, and, you know, and and we've it's it's always kind of been it the like diversity was has been like a big thing in terms of like where I'm coming from. Um, you know, even before everything from this past year, but it's it was it was just as much a springboard to be able to yeah have um, have a way to kind of work on do like work around new work, but it's just as much community and how much art the arts can actually like. You know, yeah, it's just, it it can be escapism, but it's just as much a way to for people to process and um, work through things and and everything. Like, yeah, some people weren't really creating, others were. Um, you know, so it's just as much. It's, so it's it's been a little bit of a mixed bag, but it's you know, it's that's one of the things I've always loved about the arts. It's it's been around for so long, and they've you know, it's been something that it can bring people together. Mm -hmm. And it's a, just as much of a way for people to, you know, talk about things, heal, laugh, escape, you name it, it's, it's there, um, you know, and then, you know, and this is very much true from like stuff I, I, I have a propensity to want to work on to friends that are running companies of their own and the type of work that they're producing. Yes. Craig, how have you seen some of the, the businesses and companies that you work with pivot in the last year? Sure, look, the last year itself has been interesting, I guess is one word, challenging is another. It really depends on, on your perspective. Um, and realistically, look, Latin America has taken a very different approach, uh, and I'm generalizing, uh, to the US in regards to what they've done with COVID. Uh, in principle, most of Latin America, excluding Brazil, has taken quite a conservative approach, probably more like, a, a, I guess, a, a California approach uh, to it. Now, with that said, that that's too general life. However, you know what I, what I find is the massive contradiction. You know, particularly when we deal with U.S. companies and other, um, is whilst the U.S. is very liberal, you know, you can do what you want. Whether there's not really enforced lockdowns, particularly they're not the same degree they have down here. But businesses in the U.S. will not return to the office until I don't know another year. Conversely, here where I'm in Colombia. They've had a number of lockdowns, and these are quite severe, where you can't leave your home uh, at all, basically, or you go to the shop and come home, and that's otherwise you'll get arrested. 
But conversely, we've been back in the office since July last year uh, okay. with certain conditions, et cetera. So the reality is they've taken uh, a far more, I guess, controlling approach. Um, and, you know, the reality for good or bad is in Latin America, they're more willing to accept that at a cultural level. So, for example, we can work back in the office because we have a certain local government permit, but that means our office can only be a maximum of 50% filled. So we have to rent a second office to spread out. Uh, we can, we must have temperature checks and various things to enter the office. There must be face masks when my face mask is right here, uh, when in the office, um, et cetera. So the reality is it's a, there's far more controls in place, but in many respects from a working environment, the working environment is far more normal than what perhaps people will be seeing in the US. Um, so as you can see, we have a company logo behind me because I'm sitting in the conference room. So how are, we, how are we seeing companies pivot and adjust, et cetera? Obviously, you know, clients and companies, a lot of them have pivoted online and they're doing all the online marketing and websites and SEO and all that wonderful stuff that goes with it. Um, but conversely, a lot of them have just looked at different markets uh, and different opportunities to present themselves. Um, you know, at the end of the day, just because you're selling X today, it doesn't mean you can't pivot and change to be selling X and Y. Um, so it's presented some opportunities. Um, and conversely, um, you know, one of, the, one of the simple ones we see, uh, particularly from, I guess it's a bit of a generalization, et cetera, and I'm sort of deviating here, you know, one of the things you'll, you'll notice, for example, in Mexico is the concept of tequila, for example, in Mexico is very different to the concept of tequila, perhaps in most of the US. In the US, tequila is what uh, you know teenagers or university kids would have their shots. At. I'm sure there are some wonderful people in the audience here uh, and the guests that have had a few too many tequilas on occasion, uh, and they have those shots. Conversely, when you go to Mexico, tequila itself is actually more like a whiskey. You actually drink it very slowly, uh, and you sip your tequila. Um, because the fact, and particularly you get different levels of quality of tequila depending on its age, et cetera. And they also have a de derivation of that called mezcal, et cetera. So, you know, it's some of those common perceptions, et cetera, do change based on where you are, et cetera. It just comes back to, I don't know, the 60s or 70s, whatever. Um, you know, whoever it was at the time, Jose, Jose Cuervo was very good at um, exporting and branding tequila to be that when it's very different when you get there locally. Um, so that's sort of, you know, what we're seeing here is just, you know, everyone's changing, we're evolving, um, but, you know, the reality is, fortunately, I guess we're probably on the coming out slowly of this whole pandemic thing with vaccinations things happening, so, um, you know, I'm still positive. Yes, I am positive as well. I love the tequila example, see, but it's another idea of just relax, chill, you know what I mean? Take a sip. See, in America, we want to take the shot and rush it. Whereas, you, you're rushing to the end stage rather yes, than enjoying, enjoying the road to get there. Yes, see, we got to slow down and enjoy life. This has been a great show. I had a lot of fun. Now, we are coming down to the last few minutes of the show. And what I love to do at the end of every show is just simply allow my guests the opportunity to speak directly to the audience, to everyone who is watching this show live, as well as everyone who is watching it in the archives, and let them know what you want them to take away from your appearance here today. And we're going to start with you, Michelle. Um, so with that, um, you know, one thing I'd like people to know is that, you know, having real world, uh, real world strategies to do, like, to work, to develop what you're doing, develop your business, bring your ideas to life, all of that, it's totally, totally achievable. And, you know, and it's being able to bring your vision to, to life in a, in a way that um, it's deeply fulfilling and financially rewarding is let's do it, let's make it happen, um, <laughs> you know? And, you know, it's just, it's that and being able to be able to build community is also wonderful and you know looking looking forward to the chance with connecting with everyone here further and the chance to meet new people absolutely i like michelle michelle said it's deeply rewarding but you got to make the money at the end of the day you know what yeah. i mean that's what i said everybody always trying to save the world that's nice that's good but i always tell people well, i'm no good to anybody broke yeah. at all 
and it's being able to find that balance of like you know because it's very much like that whole starving artist mm-hmm. thing is com- like it it's complete bs like you know i i, right. I, I very much like wanting to be a thrive like being able to do what you love and thrive yes and figuring out what that what that looks like for each of us because you know even with with the five of us here it can being a successful fill in the blank can look a little different for all of us so it's just as much let's do it let's bring let's bring your vision to life that's right and make that money thank you michelle (laughs) courtney what do you have for us uh just just to go along with what michelle said just to take that passion and find a way to make it work in the numbers. You know, I always say that even if all business taxes were abolished tomorrow, you should still have good accounting. So, yeah, you know, like yep. you know, so you know what your company is doing, you know, IBM, Apple, Google, they do the accounting for them. They don't do it for the government. So to go find that and also to get those numbers and find out the story so that you can budget your time, you know, what the wealthy have more than anything over other people is time and building a business that doesn't require you to work 80 hours a week in it for to be successful so yes preach Courtney where can people find out more information about you Uh, our website is the best place to do that uh, thebookkeepernc.com thebookkeepernc.com thank you Courtney Jennifer talk to us all right if, um, one thing I've noticed in this conversation today is just the importance of being able to pivot, to be resilient, and that comes about through critical thinking skills. I know that Courtney- It's like, let's get back to the critical thinking. <laughs> it is, I mean, it is. Sharika, you've had to adapt uh, quite a bit within this year. You, you're celebrating a year um, with, uh, with doing this. You stuck with it. You had to adapt, and you know, because how you started day one is different from how um, you is different from day 365. Um, we've seen Craig discuss how he had to pivot and, and Michelle discuss how to pivot. Um, and also Courtney about pivoting and really just making sure that yes, you have this passion and you have this goal, but you still need to make sure that you're successful and that you're profitable. And, and that's what we do in business. We, we, we solve problems for people in, in exchange for profits. That's what we do. Um, and that's what I hope to pour into my students, uh, with my, I, I love, like, I'm a diehard math writing person. Love it. Uh, I am the child. I've never heard that before. I I am a child of a semi-retired math teacher and we will have conversations about why does this textbook not have this in there? And that is what me and my mama talk about, um, (laughs) among other things. So what I'll say is, you know, don't wait until the high blood pressure gets off the tracks. Call me so I can help you with your child's reading, comprehension skills, math skills, which ultimately leads to critical thinking skills. This summer, we are we have a math and literacy program. We have um, essay writing for college admissions and scholarships. And we also have test preparation. And at the end, we have a family game night that I'm doing online. And then we have a symposium. So my students aren't like that baby who was a valedictorian and got in front of the class and got in front of the audience and started to cry at the at the surprise of humanity facing uh, looking at him. Um, if you'd like to learn more about Scholar Ready, I'm Jennifer Ledwith. You can find out about Scholar Ready in the show notes. Um, our website is listed there. It's www.scholarready.com. And let's talk about how we can work together during the summer and also throughout the year. Absolutely. Let's work together to make it happen. Thank you, Jennifer. Mr. Dempsey, go ahead and take us out. Sure. Look, uh, I'm just going to relate back to my army days. Um, And that means I'm a little bit more direct than I normally am. And that's simply my lasting message would be to get off your ass, to get off your couch and actually do something. There's nothing lost with actually giving something a go. Uh, And that's what I'd encourage people to do. I mean, you know, let's stop talking about things. Let's start doing things. You fail, you learn, you move forward. It's very, very simple. That's what I would say. Whether it's politically correct or not, I really don't care. <laughs> Fortunately, in the part of the world I live in, it's a lot less um, touchy-feely in regards to these sorts of things. And sometimes that's what people need to hear. Uh, so that's what I would say. Get out, give it a go. Lots to be done, lots to be achieved. And who knows, you might just be successful enough and pat yourself on the back with it. I like it. Do you have a podcast, Craig? 
No, I don't have a podcast, unfortunately. Um, I must admit, I, I tend to be a little bit busy. And when I do get time off, I love traveling. So I usually find myself selling myself on some random beach in the world if I can. I guess it's good to be correct, but I'm telling you, you, I would listen to a podcast that you hosted, you know, j just do a couple of episodes all in one day and then put them out there. It could be called get off your ass and give it a go with Craig Dempsey. I like that, Craig. I do. I do like your motto. I think we should stick with that. Um, <laughs> however, that might be for another show or another day to talk about. I love it. This has been a great show. Thank you all for being here. I definitely appreciate all of you. And I especially want to thank everyone who tuned in to watch this show live, as well as everyone who was watching it in the archives. Just because you didn't catch the show live doesn't mean you're not important. And it doesn't mean we still don't need your support because we do. Please go ahead and share the show. But I always ask, please do not just watch the show. Do not just share the show. I appreciate that. But the most important thing is that you support our guests. Our guests are here this morning to assist you to share their journeys with you, their advice, their strategies, and their guidance. So support them. Their website link is in the Facebook post. But as always, I ask that you don't just visit their websites. Follow them on social media. Reach out to them. Send them a message. And when you do, please let them know Sharifa Hardy says hi. Now, if you're interested in more ways that I can help your business, or maybe you want to be a guest on the Roundtable Talk Show, please visit my website at AskSharifa.com. Until tomorrow, which is my birthday, 45th birthday, it's going to be a fun show tomorrow. So tune in to the Roundtable Talk Show. Until then, everyone have a safe and a blessed day.